Hello and welcome to the Diary of a Self-Published Author with me, Stuart White. Hello and welcome to the Diary of a Self-Published Author, episode 11 with me, Stuart White. Really nice to be recording this episode today from what is basically the, the first empty house I've had in a long time. Uh, the, the kids are away, so there'll be no little visitors in the background or noises that make me have to stop recording halfway through and uh, rejig it all by the end. So hopefully uh, this episode will be a, a nice clean one and it'll be one where I can relax a little bit knowing that I'm uh, unlikely to be disturbed, which is nice. Uh, today's date's Friday the 11th of August and um recording this one a couple of weeks after the, the last one that I did. Um, we're coming towards the end of the summer holidays here in Scotland, so soon I'll be back into my normal routine, which means I'm hoping to be able to go back to a weekly uh, recording program and be able to update, update you a little bit more often on my trials and tribulations of my self-publishing uh, career so far. So we're going to kick off the show this week by discussing a few things which have come up in the last few weeks in my self-publishing journey and then obviously covering a bit more general stuff as well afterwards and uh, doing a few frequently asked questions that people have, have sent in as well about self-publishing and trying to cover those during the, the course of the episode. So I want to start off first of all by talking a little bit about audiobooks because this is something that I have been looking into for my Ghost of Mars book over the last couple of weeks and I've been looking at how I can go about producing a good quality audiobook to go alongside the the paperback and the ebook that's up at the moment. And I've, I've been researching the different ways into that, the different methods you can use, the pros and cons of each, you know. I'll sort of briefly discuss the those, you know, with with respect to, to my own book, um, but hopefully some of those will be applicable for yourself when you're you're doing your own audiobook research as well. So I started off by looking at, first of all, what the cost would be to have an audiobook produced by a company where I outsourced everything, but I, I paid for everything. And um, so they would find the, the voice actor, they would do it in their studio, they would do all the production and the engineering of the, the sound afterwards as well and put it all together in a wee package for me and basically just send me the file or files. That option for, for me personally was looking too costly. Um, we were looking at in excess of £2,000 from for most of the quotes that I got for, for those and when trying to project how many audiobooks I would have to sell to make that money back, especially, you know, because audiobooks are on the rise, they're, they've been purchased and, and the medium that are been used or have the greatest growth overall. But for middle grade, that's not necessarily true. Um, so I was thinking, you know, and, and, and the thing with middle grade, of course, as well, is, is targeting is difficult because you can't target your, your intended reader because they are obviously a bit younger and you know targeting older readers for younger kids audiobooks can be trickier not not impossible but can be trickier so i decided i didn't think i wanted that huge initial outlay which is a shame because there's a lot of pros to going down that route obviously the, the disadvantage is the upfront cost but the pros are that you own all of the files they, they are your property from that point onwards that you get full royalties on any sales now obviously it depends on the platform you're with they, they'll take their own cut as well but everything that's author royalties goes towards you and you can also take them up put them down put them on whatever platform you want at any point in time and um, you have a lot more flexibility with it and the other thing you can do is you can sell direct as well via your website and um, a lot of people have started doing that now and have, have found that that works, especially if they have quite a loyal uh, readership who are happy to go through maybe the one or two extra steps that it requires to download the audiobook if they buy it direct from you compared with 
if they buy it direct from you know the mainstream providers of audiobooks. So you know there's some pros and cons there, but I decided that unfortunately the con of the upfront cost was was just going to be a bit too prohibitive uh, for me at this stage. So I then looked into the other options, which are royalty share options that are offered by ACX. Now ACX is like the the Amazon version of audiobooks and your books will go up into it like audio uh, audible uh, i think itunes as well and they will be available there now you, there's a couple you can choose exclusive and non-exclusive as well when you upload to acx uh, and obviously if you go exclusive with them your royalty rates are are higher and if you go non-exclusive your royalty rates are lower obviously but it means you can go wider it's the same same rub as i guess when you go kindle unlimited or wide with your your ebooks as well, but yeah, I I I looked into that as well, and I again was thinking, well, I could pay now the the, the quotes, the amount of money I would pay to get my audiobook produced through ACX, and I get to keep it, were were a bit lower. But the one of the reasons for that was looking at the quality of what was being produced. A lot of the people were individuals, individual uh, voice narrators who had maybe their own studio at home or something so we're doing it all themselves and when i was listening to some of the um the, the excerpts that they, they post up and um, to you know the samples to see if you if you like their voice and the quality and so on i was just finding the quality wasn't as high uh there and i, I was thinking I, I don't know if i want to be paying you know uh, hundreds if not thousands of pounds for something that's not that you know great quality and i'd have to get redone in the end as well so that that was a bit of an issue for me, and I, I, I and so I've still got, actually got the the edition um, up on ACX at the moment. A couple of people have auditioned, but the quality's not been good enough, um, as well as the voice just not been quite right for it. So the the search for that will continue, and um, I'll, I'll leave it up in ACX with editions open and see um, who who auditions for it, and, and if if they are the right person, the right quality for for that. I'm not. I'm not totally opposed to not doing the audiobook at all. Actually, um, if it's if it's not if I can't do it on you know in the right terms, I think I'd rather not do it than than do it poorly or um, do it in a way that means that ultimately I'm going to miss out in the long term. So um, we'll, we'll see. But but ACX um, just just for the, the sake of balance as well for other people that are interested, ACX also offer a royalty share scheme where you and the the audio uh, narrator or producer, sometimes often they're the same person, they will do a, a share with you on the, the royalties. So if you go exclusive with ACX, you get 40% on your audiobook sales. And that means 20% each on the royalty share option. But the, the advantage of doing that, you're giving away 20% of your royalties, but the advantage is there's no upfront cost. And so essentially the narrator and producer are working on a, you know, a, a royalty basis rather than an upfront fee, which, um, yeah, like, I'll, you know, some people won't do. Um, I guess if, you, if you're if you confident in the quality of of the, the books that you're producing, the audio books, then you don't necessarily have to go for that option. You can just wait and wait till people are willing to pay you for the, the for your services. So, yeah, anyway, there's, there's, there is um, advantages and disadvantages to, to both methods. And I, I'm, I'm still exploring them all. I'm not closed to to anything but i will continue to to do that and i'll update you if i decide to go one way or the other but at the moment i'm just in the exploration stage of that so that's why i thought it'd be a, a nice wee opening uh, topic to to discuss because of that second up today i'm going to discuss um book covers again it's something i have talked about in previous episodes as well but it's such an important one for me I think when you're a, an indie author, you have to ensure, and again, I'm, I know I'm banging this drum again, but you have to ensure that your book is of similar quality and fits in well with every other book that people see on Amazon or if it's in physical copies in shops or whatever. It needs to look like it belongs. And unfortunately, a lot of indie authors' books don't. And sometimes it's immediately obvious and sometimes it's only more obvious when you, you, you have a closer look uh, because there's a there's a lot of ways there's a lot of ways to get a cover i mean i should we should probably cover that ground as well 
Um, I've seen that um, some companies have been producing these cover template type things where you can go in, you can obviously you can edit the title and the name, your name in the front, but the rest of it's already designed and done and so on, um, which are relatively cheap. And I can see the appeal in people going for them because A, you know what the product looks like up front, which is a plus. It's relatively cheap because they're not having to do much customization or anything afterwards. So that's obviously a, a, another plus. But the negative is that it will feel generic probably because it's not been designed with your book and your themes and premise and characters at the heart of the design. So it can have a bit of that, that feel to it, I think. Anyway, and it's, what, it's why I probably wouldn't ever go for one of those. Um, so you can do that and you can also do customized options usually with the same companies where you you ask them to do x y and z with it which obviously costs a little bit more but they're doing it from that original template a lot of the time so it's just it's just changes as opposed to come up with a brand new concept with it so that's one way obviously you can get a book cover but for me i think it lacks soul whenever i see a cover that's done that way i can tell when they've been done uh, from a template or whether they have been done from scratch by you know collaborative design with a an illustrator or a designer so it's yeah it's anyway the reason i brought that up is because i saw my latest cover uh, last week for my third book the astra firestar time travel middle grade book it's uh one i'm, I'm excited about and i'm especially excited now that i've seen the the sketches for the cover it's it's not quite done yet i've, I've asked for a few changes and so on but um it's, it's certainly getting there and because i talk about this all the time but because i've been so collaborative in the process and i've been able to give a design brief from the start i've been able to give descriptions of characters my illustrator who is incredible at getting across personality and a still image with characters um, has has done such a good job again and i think that's so important you know i, I think you know, wh whatever you're paying you know those and i was looking at the price of those custom uh or sorry the template covers and also the custom ones and then pricing it against you know what, what i'm paying to work with an individual and it's all sort of very bespoke for that for for my book and it's not actually that much of a difference it's a few hundred pounds and that might that might sound like a lot but i will always say this the money you don't spend on your cover you will lose out on sales to that value if not to multiples of that value over time because you don't spend it and and it's uh, it's a one it's, it's for me anyway it's just that one-off cost for a you know 20 30 year indie career where you can continue to take advantage of your brilliant cover on your book and it will make such a difference to readers when they're browsing and you know it, it, for, for in terms of marketing and stuff as well your cover is basically your number one marketing tool and so you want that to be the, the, the very best quality that it can be and, and but also the most personalized and bespoke, bespoke that it can be for your particular novel so I can't bang that drum about covers hard enough because it is, I think it is so important and as I say, it's very exciting to see your cover and I'm, I'm hopefully uh, going to be able to do a cover review at some point, maybe next month or maybe in October uh, when the manuscript is, is close to being ready as well because that's needing one more edit too. Speaking of which, um, I am also due to release my YA novel on the 30th of August this month in just over two weeks time. Uh, it's, it's 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 coming in faster than than um i felt like with my first book it took a long time you know for the the launch day to finally arrive but with this one it feels like it's come in really fast and that's probably because i've given myself a lot less time in the lead up to this one maybe but um anyway the it's going really well that I, I finally finished tinkering with it and doing edits and and so on i now have a completed book it's it's one of those that I had to let go and just say, I don't know if I'll ever have this exactly the way I want it, but it's as good as I can get it right now. And so that's that's gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to just accept that. And I've had I've had a lot of great feedback from beta readers and people who've read it early and so on. So I'm I'm confident that it's it's you know it's a good book and people will enjoy it. But I'm not gonna 
yeah, I'm not going to continue to to berate myself about you know for small gains in terms of the overall manuscript. I think it's it's there now, and so I have uploaded it to the various places, and it will obviously be available uh, 30th August. You can uh, do pre-orders on the ebook at the moment, and the paperback pre-order will, will probably be about a week before it actually comes out. Um, I, I'm not going to do a long run on that. Um, the the numbers show that long runs and, and pre-orders for paperbacks are um, are often not actually that that productive. And for for indies, we want um, more of a, a sort of peak in terms of sales, in terms of a surge of sales, uh, in terms because our our sales count, you know, and in time chronologically when they're, they're purchased rather than with traditionally published books where pre-orders all go into that first week of sales for, for their charts so um, yeah I'm gonna I'm just gonna hold off on that I think until about a week or a few days before the actual release date for, for pre-orders in the paperback. One thing I have started to release though are the arcs for the nameless so um, about 60 people signed up to be an ARC reader, which is great. And I've sent those uh, via book funnel, which I'll talk about in a minute, to those 60 readers. And it's, it's good as well with book funnel. You can see in time uh, how many people and who have, have downloaded, uh, who have clicked your, your email, first of all, but then who's downloaded the, the ARC copy as well. So it's quite nice for keeping an eye on, you know, you know who's got the book, who's reading it, and uh, maybe who you can expect to, to leave your review you know, come come publication time as well, um, which is nice. And so I'm hoping that they will uh, help spread the word. They'll they'll read the book. They'll enjoy it. They'll be a, a an early an early fan and might can you know convince other people to to have a look at it as well. But um, and, you know, the, like it's most it's mostly people I know on on the art reading team. So I'm I'm hopeful they'll all be kind enough. Um, because it's nice to go and you know go out with a, a new book and have some nice reviews. Um, before you get the you know the odd uh, the odd one which isn't great and I've, been, I've actually been lucky with with Ghost of Mars there's not really been any um, awful ones um, I think I think three stars the worst um, but yeah um, it's not it's not been terrible I know some people get a, a harder time and I wonder if my YA one potentially because it's hitting more of my you know the pe- person re- leaving the review is more my audience than than adults i wonder if that might um might open me up a little bit more to to people that might not enjoy it but anyway i'm i'm ready for it um i think that that's part of the process of uh, selling your books and being an indie publisher and, and putting it out there you have to just accept that um it's not going to be for everyone so i'm sending those arcs through book funnel and if you've heard of book funnel you'll know how great it is and if you haven't then it's well worth having a look at if you are uh, an indie author because not just in the immediate term but in the long term it's a great tool for distributing you know art copies for example but also if you want to give away ebooks if you want to do like a giveaway to get people sign up to your newsletter. They've got nice integrations that go from Book Funnel to Mailchimp, Mailer Light, or whoever your um, newsletter provider is, which is quite handy if you want to do uh, those kind of giveaway type things to get newsletter subscribers. I know that they're very very popular amongst the, the indie community, mm-hmm. and it is a very intuitive and easy to navigate platform as well. I, I quite like book funnel and it's, it's not terribly expensive it's it's a wee bit of a an annual cost but i think i think it was 80 dollars when i signed up um i'm not 100 percent sure if that'll be the price today but I, I i felt like it was worth it because what they do with the, the the copies you send out as well you can put hidden watermarks in them for example which means that you know there's no way to effectively stop piracy is there but it, it helps a little bit with um, peace of mind, I guess, if you just know that when when you send it out there, you know, in terms of copyright issues and stuff, if someone downloads a copy and then they end up uploading, you know, the same book or whatever, then you can say, well, actually, you know, and, and that that will help you out. Um, and uh, with regards to little things like that, but but not just that, they they offer um a plethora of different download options as well for the for the person that clicks on the link, and they can get a PDF just to read on their computer. They can get a whole bunch of different uh, ebook, ePub, Mobi, um, 
etc. Uh, Nook, all the all these different platforms you can read ebooks on. They have different files for all those different platforms as well, so people can choose, and, and it's quite nice. It's quite tailored rather than you know EPUB is is reasonably universal, but not doesn't work on everything. So um, it's good to have that variety for the person. That means that your readers got the preferred version of the the manuscript. So book funnel really useful. Um, if you if you've used it before, you'll know that. And if you haven't, then and you're looking to distribute books, then and check it out. They also have loads of other options as well that I didn't mention there. They have got the option to like team up with other authors and do giveaways and, and all sorts. But um, I haven't really gone into that in much depth yet. But I'll, I'll update you if, if I do try out any of those other features. Uh, the next thing on my, my list for the the diary this week was to get my novellas written. Now, I mentioned this in a previous episode, but part of my my marketing plan over the next couple of years is to have a couple of standalone, but related to uh, novellas for the series that I'm going to be writing, the Eva Knight series and also the, the Nameless series, which I'm going to start on the YA side. And having those short novella type stories which feature characters, um, I'm going to have them as prequels, so before the, the first books in the series, um, are, are a nice way to try and lure readers into your story world. As, <laughs> lure's probably not the right word. That's it. That makes it sound like you're, you're, you're taking them somewhere that's not necessarily good for them, but you know what I mean, like trying to get them um, hooked on your story world so that further down the line they might want to buy subsequent books in the, in the series, you know, full-length books. And so um, I'm finishing those off just now. The Ghost of Mars one is nearly done and the other one needs a bit of work. Um, but that's that's something I'm going to be working on in the very near future to get done. And then hopefully over time, I'll be able to use giveaways and such things to uh, get people to incentivize, uh, uh, to sign up to the newsletter and to uh, become a fan of my novels um, for free. And hopefully, a, you know, it will just be a small percentage, but hopefully that small percentage of people who do read them and enjoy them will go on to then obviously pay for the, the subsequent books in the series as well. And that, you know, is a, a long term strategy is used by a lot of established indie authors. So I'm just getting started on that myself, but I'm hoping that the work I'm putting in just now, even though there'll be no immediate payoff, will, will be fruitful for um, for me and, and my career and so on in the future. So. That's, uh, that's what I'm working on as well at the moment, which I'm actually quite excited about because it's new writing. It's nice to come up with new stories and uh, things that are different because I've, I've had a bit of a year of editing, to be honest. A lot of editing going over the same ground and the same stories and uh, that can take its toll uh, creatively because it's, it's, for me anyway, it's a very different part of my my brain that's doing the editing compared to the, the drafting. So it's nice to get back and do a little bit of that and have a bit of fun telling telling stories again so that's really my week I'm, I'm pretty much you're pretty much caught up in how the, the last week or two has been for me and the things that I've been up to but the next section and um, we're going to do is the the frequently asked questions section where I'll answer some of the questions that you guys have sent in for for me to answer so the first question that has been asked this week is about a uh, launch events so uh, the person said, well, looking at local indie bookshops and other venues to host a lunch, I'm wondering, can you actually sell books from a coffee shop or a pub and do children's authors hold lunches in the evening or should I be aiming for a, a day event or a weekend? Uh, good, good question. Um, not, not something I'm an expert in because I've not actually done a, a live launch event. I've just done uh, online ones. Uh, but I have been to um, a book launch, uh, book launches before and I've seen, um, seen how other people do them. Um, online, I, I would say yeah, it's, it's tricky with kids in the evening, um, especially if you write for younger kids. I guess so. Maybe a weekend one would be better for them. I, I think as a self-published author, you, you will you'll find it tricky, um, necessarily to unless you you know someone from a local indie bookshop or whatever to get them to uh, agree to to do that. Um, as uh, I, I, it's not something I've tried before, so it's a tricky one to answer, but. And and you can the only thing you can do is try, I guess, and you know, and go for it. Um, but you might find that it's not as as easy as it would be if, say, you know, your, your publisher was directly contacting the bookshop and saying, 
could you host this launch because obviously the um the bookshop can can buy at a greater discount rate uh, from big publishers than they can from from us indies and so on so it might be that, that there's an issue with them getting your books into stock from for the event you know as well as obviously whether they they can do the event or not in terms of coffee shops or pubs i'm not i'm not entirely sure again it would have it would come down to the um the person who runs those those venues i think from not not from selling books but from trying to sell other things in the past in those venues um i don't think i don't know if i think you do need to have a license to to sell goods on uh, other properties like like a pub or a coffee shop so i think that's something again you'd have to check with the, the owners just to make sure about um but yeah i guess i guess in terms of launch events for indie authors you have to think about what what is the purpose of your launch event is it to get your friends and family around to celebrate launching the book which is which is totally fine and um you know you, you can do that in whatever manner you want you book out a wee space at a, a venue and, and do that if you want to actually get your target audience if that's kids to um come along to the event then it might it would obviously have a different feel to it you'd want to do something which is engaging for the kids and involves in activities and so on so it would be a very different feel from an adult um, only book launch. So that's something to keep in mind too. And yeah, in terms of timings, I think you're probably right that maybe a, a you know a weekend event would be better for for younger kids than uh, an evening one when when you know kids. I don't know. I, I don't know when kids go to bed in general. My, my kids go to bed. Well, my youngest one goes to bed about half six seven. So uh, yeah, I don't know if if they would be up for going to a seven o'clock event at a bookshop to be honest but yeah anyway that from my limited knowledge about launch events that's that's the best answer i can give you in terms of school visits um what they've asked a lot of questions about these but basically you know how do you how do you get yourself into school visits and again i've only done online ones because uh with the young kids and, and my day job as a school teacher it's hard to get out to schools in person but i have found that talking um, to people online on Twitter and so on with the teachers and uh, and and the librarians and the people that are likely to to book you in for a school visit, that's that's one approach. You, you can just cold call, but I guess you're probably more likely to just be ignored if you do that. And um, then if you develop a relationship, you can put a a shout out in social media or elsewhere or in your newsletter for people to um, to take you on for a school visit. Just say I've got you know space in the diary. Does anyone want a school visit? Blah blah. blah. Uh, I, I, my approach has been to um, not not necessarily offer the visits for free, although I have done one for free. Uh, is to offer them for you know not not very high cost initially, while you're sort of learning and getting your foot in the door, and and that will appeal obviously to budget tight schools at the moment. If you're if you're going to cost a little bit less, um, so and and ultimately, as we know, like you know, young kids, especially primary kids. They, they have no concept of uh, which publisher has published your book or, or not, or you know, whether you're traditionally or self-published. It doesn't matter to them. If they, if they can see a physical book, then they're going to see it's a published book, and that, that's all really that matters. So I don't think from the kids' point of view um, it will be it's something to be worried about or scared about. Um, I've found that you know the, the kids have been so nice in the in the visits that I've done um, they, they they're chatty they've got lots of questions uh, they yeah they, they make they make the whole experience really really worthwhile so I would say go for it don't don't be afraid to to put yourself out there to reach out to teachers the worst that can happen is that you get either silence or they say oh, we don't have the budget or whatever but uh, the more you reach out obviously the more chance you have that someone will say oh yeah actually we do need someone to come along and do this particular event so that's something that's uh, worth considering as well so put yourself out there um i think that's a, a big thing with being an indie published author is no one else is going to do it for you and um, you don't have a whole team of people doing all the various publicity and marketing jobs for you so you just have to put yourself out there and um and yeah be your own be your own uh, publicist and blow your own trumpet and all that and then last one um is the, the you've the, they've asked about um what are the main steps to take in the, the lead up to publication? And they've made a little to-do list. Um, I'll, I'll read those out. Uh, they said, set up for pre-order, beg for reviews, uh, cover quotes, social media push, launch event, and school visits. So um, I would say 
for me anyway the, the key thing is is the book and uh, make sure that and and, and I, I've definitely done it this time around with my, the book that's about to be released in a couple of weeks I've made my focus very much on the book and not about all the other stuff because ultimately that's the thing that matters you know that you can do the best campaign in the world around it but if the book's not great then it doesn't really matter and, and actually all the campaign energy and so on is uh, is wasted energy you may as well uh, put that into making the, the story as good as it can be but yes you do probably want to be doing some things so um you know you mentioned about reviews there I, um earlier in the, the episode i talked about sending out uh, uh, art copies of the the book to uh art copies <laughs> stands for advanced reader copies isn't it so it's advanced reader copies copies um anyway the i've sent them out to about 60 or so people so i'm hoping that i'll get some reviews from that um just asking people engaging with them on social media and your newsletter and so on is also another way that you can get um, more reviews it's, it's, it's hard to get reviews before the book's out and so i wouldn't worry if you know you you don't have anything on publication day or in the first week or two after and um, they do tend to come two three months down the line in my experience um in the last book so just you know be patient with them but also um keep nudging people on it because people can leave reviews but they, they often forget and it's i, I think 90 percent of the reviews i i leave are based on the the author uh, nudging in some way and socials or through their newsletter or, or something similar i see them saying oh can you know if you've read the book can you leave a review and i go and do it um whereas if they didn't say that I, you know possibly wouldn't so it's it's well worth um making sure you do that uh, cover quotes i wouldn't worry too much about that unless you you know some writers who are, are willing to do some cover quotes for you, you know, your close pals or um or who reach out to you and, and ask you but it's not it's not essential like a lot of covers don't have a quote on them um i know it's definitely a a big thing with a lot of traditionally published uh, novels at the moment is uh, to get those but you know equally there's a lot that don't so i wouldn't i wouldn't sweat that um if you know someone who'll do it then great and if you don't then not not a big deal either um social media push yep definitely post on all your socials but i'd say just two two three weeks before it's due to be launched is, is a good time to start pushing it um if you if you go earlier you risk you know burnout on your part but also fatigue on um other people's part about you know you posting about it too much and so on so i definitely do that but maybe yeah just have a a sort of more intensive one around about the time of the launch because everyone gets excited for you then you're excited you know it's it's people are more forgiving about lots of posting in and around it so i wouldn't worry too much about doing it too far in advance except obviously for for big things like cover reveals or when it goes in pre-order and such things um the actual launch events we kind of discussed that already didn't we in, in the previous questions there but um i'm just going to have online launch events i think um on the whole because it's cheap it's easy um you can more of your friends can come um i've got a lot of friends from writing friends from around the uk that love uh, supporting me and they, it's easy for them just to jump in a zoom call one evening rather than um coming to to like a shop and an arbitrary place like edinburgh or london or something um and those are nice i like i've, I've been to, you know i have been to book launch and I like in person it's nice but it's not something that i think is essential and i think most indie authors are, are similar as well uh, and school visits you know i've just covered that in the last question too but um if you've got a local school that might be happy to have you along that's that's a good start it's a good bit of experience and then you can you can build from there but i wouldn't say any of these uh those last couple of things are like essentials they're just nice uh, cherries on top but you have to actually make sure you bake the cake well and it tastes good so that's what your uh, time should be spent on which is making the book itself as good as it can be all right so anyway that's the, the end of the, the frequent last question section i hope the answers to that have been useful to anyone who is listening and um please do ask uh, either through social media through my facebook group which is the diary of a self-published author if you want to find me on facebook and add yourself to the group you can ask questions on there and i'll answer them both in the facebook group but also in the show as well and yeah you can basically get in touch with me anywhere to ask questions that you want me to answer on the podcast so that's it for episode 11 of the diary of a self-published author been nice to be back and, and chatting about all these things and sort of processing everything that i've been up to um, and then obviously trying to share as much um, insight and, and knowledge as i can for you to help 
uh, you with your, you know, starting up your indie author journey. And I hope that you'll you'll spread the word about the, the podcast, especially to people who are new uh, to to becoming an indie author, because I think that self-publishing can seem really overwhelming at first. And I think podcasts which discuss particularly those beginning stages are, are so useful for when you're in that particular zone so and I know, I know that all the blog posts and podcasts I listened to when I was learning were, were so useful for me and so I'm just hoping that there's a few wee things in what I'm saying that might be useful to some of you all right so I'll catch you all next time